welcome to the Healthy Lifestyles Podcast, located here in Northwest Phoenix, Glendale, and Peoria. My name is Dr. Nick Hunter. I am your host, and I am a doctor of physical therapy, and I own and operate Preferred Physical Therapy, where we have helped hundreds of people aged 40 plus stay active and independent, live free from painkillers, and avoid surgery, even if they've had pain for years. This podcast is intended to help you make better decisions about your health so you can find joy in the journey by bringing together top healthcare providers, fitness experts, and nutritionists in the area to give you knowledge and confidence needed to make good health decisions. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the Healthy Lifestyles Podcast, located here in Northwest Phoenix, Glendale, and Peoria. My name is Dr. Nick Hunter. I'm a doctor of physical therapy, and I own and operate Preferred Physical Therapy, where we have helped hundreds of people aged 40 plus stay active and independent, live free from painkillers, and avoid surgery, even if they've had pain for years. I've written eight eBooks on how to treat common injuries and hosted numerous webinars, all in an effort to help educate the public on how to care for and maintain their bodies to live with joy, dignity, and without compromise. This podcast is intended to help you make better decisions about your health so you can find joy in the journey by bringing together top healthcare providers, fitness experts, and nutritionists in the area to give you the knowledge and confidence needed to help you make good healthcare decisions. Thank you for joining us today. I'm joined by Allie Burkett. She's a board certified physician assistant who specializes in integrative medicine. She's been practicing for nine years and has a certification in anti-aging medicine through the Academy of Anti-Aging. She has a background in family medicine and urgent care and served in the U.S. Air Force for four years following her physician assistant program. She specializes in evaluating and treating nutrient deficiencies, hormone deficiencies or imbalances due to thyroid, adrenals, or sex hormones, inflammation and toxin load to include heavy metals and myotoxins, neurotransmitter imbalance or deficiencies, gut dysfunctions, including food sensitivities, SIBO and leaky gut dysfunctions, and long haul COVID symptoms, as well as chronic and acute pain. Now, Ali, did I miss anything in that introduction? I don't think so. Those are the main things that I see and treat every day, so. I mean, of course, I have patients come in with unusual or atypical symptoms or issues that I am happy to try and evaluate and treat, but I would say that's a pretty inclusive list of of what I do. Awesome. So tell us about yourself a little bit. What made you so passionate about the kind of work that you're in? So I went to, attended Midwestern University and I joined the Air Force while I was in school to help pay for school. (laughs) Yeah, great idea. And yeah, and um, they sent me to uh, Sacramento, California. I was at a remote base. And then I was in the UK for two years practicing family medicine. And uh, when I separated, I moved home and practiced more family medicine and some urgent care. And I came to the realization that I I felt like I was pushing medication on patients, that I was essentially, it it even boils down to how I was taught in school, which was these, this is how your patients will present. These are the different things that you should consider as far as what could be their diagnosis. Here's how you can evaluate that. And here are all of the different medications that you can use to treat that patient. I, and you didn't like that. You didn't no, like the idea of medications. I, right. I felt as though there had to be a better way to, I just felt like I wasn't getting to the root of my patient's issues. I felt mm-hmm. like I was putting a Band-Aid on a symptom. And then most of the time there'd be a side effect to the Band-Aid that I gave them. And I, the, a lot of patients wouldn't come, wouldn't return feeling better. There would be something else going on or, you know, their symptoms were still present. 
So I, I figured that it was, I, I decided it was more important to learn how to address the root causes of why my patients feel the way that they feel, um, which I, I, a lot of pe people in the world in America <laughs> experience a lot of the symptoms that I, that I see in my patients, which is mm -hmm. fatigue, you know, or low energy, trouble sleeping, mood issues, weight issues, memory loss, dizziness, uh, gut dysfunction, chronic joint pain, you know, libido issues. And instead of, of course, there is an appropriate time to prescribe a medication. You know, I'm not saying that that's not something that I, I would never do. I, I do prescribe medication, but if, if I can find a different, the reason that they're experiencing these issues, that's what I'm trying to target. So, Definitely. so you're looking to prescribe medication that will attack the root cause versus trying to appease symptoms of that root cause without right. actually addressing and, and what's going sometimes, on. Sometimes it's not prescribing a medication. I would say one of the number one things that I see is nutri nutrient deficiency. So not surprising, I'm sure to you, is that most people don't have a well-rounded diet and eat on the go because everyone's living this 24 7 365 lifestyle that they just go 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 right. and those nutrient deficiencies lead to all kind, basically that list of symptoms that i i just um said which so that's probably one of the number one things that i see is is nutrient deficiencies so if we can correct that either through diet and or supplementation with some good multivitamins, minerals, herbs, whatever it may be, a majority of people feel better just with those simple things. Just that little change. Right. Not yeah, with we a live prescription. By I'm not even writing a prescription. Yeah. 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 We hear it all the time with uh, the lifestyle of a diet of convenience versus a diet of intention. Right. And, uh, we see that also with activity where in our case, we see folks who come in injured and they're highly active. They're runners or they're CrossFit athletes or they're triathletes or they play basketball. Like they, they do the activity the thing. But what happens is when they do the same thing over and over or the one thing over and over, we, our body adapts to that. And it sounds like from what you're saying is similarly with our gut or health issues, we adapt to this diet of convenience to then we get deficient in other areas that is neglected because it's not intentional that we fill those voids. And so you, then you were able to either identify or prescribe it, whether that's through uh, supplements, herbs, or even sometimes medication that would be beneficial to, uh, to attack the, the root cause. Right, right. So to answer your question, I, your original question, I, I wanted to help them feel better without having 10 different prescriptions that they had to take every day and explain to them, look, this is why you feel the way you do. So, and what's interesting is in, in PA school, I had very limited nutrition education and that kind of blew my mind because yeah. how many, I mean, I don't know, there's tons of doctors out there that say that, you know, nutrition is your health. Your food is your health. You can heal yourself through your diet yet when I was in PA school, I think I had maybe five or six hours of nutrition education, which is not enough, not even mm -hmm. close. You know, um, some of my classmates had no nutrition background. I had done some other nutrition work and I grew up in a family where nutrition was very important. So that was a nice background, but some of my other colleagues did not have that. So then they go out into the world to treat patients. And how do you expect to you know, advise a type two diabetic with high blood pressure and high cholesterol, how to make diet changes. If you weren't, that wasn't a focus in your program. Right. You're not going to, you're going right. to you have a pill that you're going to prescribe. Exactly. Or you're going to get three probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. So why, why is that you think? Why is it you feel like, or, you, or that, what's your theory on why medical school or PA schools, primary care medicine doesn't have more nutritional involvement? I actually have a really good answer for this because I did a, ma a second master's in public health nutrition. 
And so my, my thesis or my final project was nutrition education in school, in medical school. So I did a lot of reading and research. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, that's how important it is to me. That's awesome. It, it basically boils down to that's nutrition is not what's on medical boards. They get, they get asked, hmm. medical students get asked very little about nutrition, very little. Actually, most of the questions in a medical exam, like as they're trying to get their board certification are centered on by specific vitamin deficiencies and their symptoms, but not diabetic, you know, diet counseling or, you know, hypertension counseling, none of that. So if you're a school that wants to have a high pass rate, that's not what you're going to spend your time and efforts on, unfortunately, but that's the truth. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah. They all have an agenda to, to meet or criteria to meet, and it's not on there. Interesting. And there so are, there, there, sorry, there are a few schools that's... in the U.S. that have recognized this you know, lack of education in, in school and have started some pilot programs to edu better educate their medical students so they can go out into practice with that knowledge. But their newer programs, their pilot programs, and there's probably only about five or six in the country that are, that are working on that. Hmm. Yeah. Why do you feel like this? Do you think that there's enough evidence that is going to trigger more of that education, more of that pursuit from board certified medical schools? Um, tell me what you mean. I don't think I understand. Because a, a, a lot of it we'll see, we'll see changes in medicine based on evidence-based practice. And until we have enough evidence to, to base our medical decisions on, it, it doesn't get enough traction until, until we have that evidence. Based on your on on your knowledge or your experience, are you seeing a, a growing trend around the evidence that's mounting to suggest a nutritional based approach to medicine is beneficial to the to this growing population of unhealth? I, I wish I that I could say yes, but I'm going to sound kind of cynical here. Um, the problem is that most studies, right? So we base chain we we all of our change in medicine occurs when there is data and literature to support mm -hmm. that change, right? And usually not just one or two studies, but several. Mm -hmm. Who funds this most of the studies? Big pharma. That's right. <laughs> so if the if the you know funding is not there to research these really cool pilot programs, then it's not likely that more of them are going to pop up in, in medical schools around the country, unfortunately. But. So you almost need a, a rogue group of medical practitioners right. to yes. either self-fund or start collecting, make it right. a, a legacy right. effort uh, to grow that. What we're noticing just from a consumer standpoint is how many more providers there are that are including uh, nutrition in their approach, whether that's through that naturopathic doctors, uh, a lot of functional medicine like yourself, PAs, nurse practitioners. We're seeing a lot of them who similarly like yourself, fed up and frustrated with the lack of result that they're getting from the traditional method that they were taught in school, to then also feel like this is, they got into this field to care about people, to provide care to people. And when they're seeing it come back with not the result that they're looking for, uh, it's time for a change. And right. I, very, I very similar was in, a, was in a boat, just like yourself and feeling frustrated or let down. And we're in this model, we're in this, this hamster wheel of doing the same thing over and over and expecting the result to be better. And it just keeps coming back as, as no. I mean, one of the reasons why we got into, we, we do a lot more direct to consumer or primary care approach too, where it's a lot more one-on-one -on -one with patients. And the most frustrating thing that uh, led us to this decision was the fact that under an insurance model, we could only spend 10, 15 minutes with patients. And, right. and we're expected to make all kinds of change in 10 to 15 minutes of, of actual interaction Yeah. versus the difference with now I can spend an entire 60 minutes of undivided attention with you to get to root cause issues. And a, a lot of it does come up with 
what are your eating habits? What are your sleeping habits? What recovery practices do you already have in place? And a lot of it's, un it's zero, it's unattended to. And so we're able to have a lot more time to have those conversations with people. There's just, there's no way that in your practice that you can do a thorough physical examination in that short of a time. You can't even finish an interview with the patient, you know, going into those details, but let alone, you know, if you're evaluating a knee pain, you can't just look at the knee. <laughs> you are Amen. looking at, you have to look at above and below and you need to do that in, you know, laying, sitting, standing, walking, whatever, however many. Right. So, I mean, I can't, yeah, I agree with you though. I, I do, which is why the practice that I'm in now, we don't, we don't let insurance tell us how long we spend with people. And sometimes it's 45 minutes and sometimes it's an hour and a half and it is as long as it needs to be. It takes what it takes. Yeah. Right. Right. I, Fantastic. I completely agree with you. And I think we're seeing an even increasing trend with how many more concierge medicine practices are opening up, how many we have just in this area, because right. the demand is so high and people are so fed up and frustrated with going to a doctor to spend 10, 15 minutes in the waiting room, 10 to 15 minutes in the back room, only then to get 10 to 15 minutes of actual attention from the provider to be given a prescription of medicine that they don't want to have to then get the result that they're not looking for. And yeah. it's becoming, a, it's, 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 I think, the next industry on the brink of disruption um, more than any other. Right. And we're already, we're already kind of seeing that trend. And I think what you just described is part of another huge problem that's happening in healthcare right now, which is provider burnout, um, because they themselves are fresh. You know, they don't want to practice that way. They want to give their patients attention and time. They want to listen, but they can't. They are expected to meet certain timelines and standards and get the patients in and out. And then they still have charting and it's not a great way to, it just, it's just not a great way to practice medicine. It's, it, and that is what leads to a lot of, even my friends becoming, you know, tired and losing compassion and, looking for something different because, you know, it's, it's just a difficult way to, to work. 100%. And it's one of the areas where I feel like uh, patients don't always understand the, the burden of documentation that exists for providers. Right. Because when you, when you do see so many patients per hour, it's not just the fact that I've got the one-on-one -on -one time with them, but then I've got to go in and document everything that we just did. And, right. and um, it's, it's, a very different circumstance when it's when it's seven to eight patients a day versus 25 to 30. The 10 the 10 minutes of documentation, and, and some can get it down to five, but the five minutes of documentation per patient, it it builds. And then all of all of my attention, all of my my mental capacity is going to be spent on how am I going to document and justify what I'm about to do to this insurance so that it'll it'll go through. So it'll go through and we don't have to deal with all the the rejections, denials. And then I have to resubmit uh, versus what does this patient need me to do right now to help them get relief? Like that's where I want all my mental faculty to, right. to be going towards, right. not, not all these other things. And, and that's what gets so exhausting to your point. I'm, I'm a much better provider when my patient, I'm able to, to deal with them completely 100% my compassion and energy in this moment versus the thoughts I have about the two other patients I need to keep an eye on, plus the documentation I need to be able to, to, I'm only going to do this thing because I know how to document versus I, this other thing I really want to do would be helpful, but I can't document it because I know it's going to come back in denial. Right. It's like, let me, let me and you figure out what's going to be best for you versus, Absolutely. Yep. versus me and this, this third party over here that no one knows has no, <laughs> no interaction with whatsoever, but they're going to be the ones dictating your care. Right. It, it's an impossible model. To, to, I, to I can't tell you how many times I've had I have gone back and forth with an insurance company to get something for my patient that they actually need, but the insurance company has decided that they do not qualify. Yeah. Based on what, on what <laughs> <Yeah>. merit? <laughs> Show me your evidence of, of why yes. you're denying it. I, how, 
Yes. Right. And, that, and, that, and that exists and it's a, it's a total suck on our providers uh, energy, our providers uh, longevity and willingness to, to really care about people. And, and it's, it's unfair. You're, you're absolutely right. right. Yeah. So tell us more about the struggles that your patients have and where functional medicine or what you do can help. Yeah. Um, so I kind of touched on it with, you know, that symptom list. Of course, there are many, many others. I would say that one of the most common reasons I see people or that has led them to me is some kind of stress in their life. And that can be a chronic, ongoing, low level type of stress where, you know, they're a single parent of two children and they're working and trying to you know, work and provide for their children and be a good mother, but also have a social life and also do special things with the kids, whatever it is. Or perhaps it was a childhood trauma. I see a lot of that. That was never, there was no therapy for that childhood trauma that has led to a chronic, you know, underlying stress response or maybe an acute re stress response. And recently, probably the most common thing that I've seen is COVID, um, which some of my patients had COVID and were sick, very sick for several weeks. And that just caused a, a body-wide inflammation and, and nobody can, you know, they've seen one or two, maybe three different people to try and help them figure out what's going on, but they can't seem to get to the bottom of it. So they end up in front of me, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. or even sometimes people get COVID and it's not that bad of an illness. So they think, but suddenly they don't feel very good. And they present to me with, with something that's going on, even with a, you know, not a very severe illness. I have a, a story. If you'd like to hear about a specific patient. Always. Okay. So, uh, a young gentleman uh, presented to me with new onset rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis. Never, no history, no genetic history of this, no family history. And so we, we went through his, you know, his medical history, his life, you know, story. And there was that chronic kind of low lying stress that I had talked about with, with work and life. And then he became ill with COVID. And very shortly after he developed that arthritis and mm -hmm. he had seen several different people who of course wanted to put him on several different medications. Mm -hmm. um, but after an evaluation with me, it became evident that he had significant nutrient deficiencies. The most common nutrient deficiency deficiencies we see are vitamin D, that should not be surprising, um, vitamin C, B vitamins, iodine, and zinc, all of which are very important factors in making hormones and, and having other enzymatic processes happen in the body. Um, and he also had some significant hormonal um, deficiencies that we corrected, and he is not on any, you know, um, steroid medication or anything like that that's going to tax his body. And he's healing. He has no inflammation. He has no pain. Uh, it feels amazing, but you know, better than he did even before he was sick with COVID. So, um, wow. it's one of the examples. Yeah. Yeah. And I, on some level I have, I've never failed with a patient. So <laughs> I've helped everyone I see on some level or another, I can't say hundred percent every time, but we definitely help at everyone we see in, in some way. Amazing. Now, when you go through treatment for these kinds of things, what is it that you're, that you're doing? What, what is it? What does a visit or a treatment yeah. session with you look like? So the, we bring everybody, the patient in for a, a new patient consultation. I, and we do have a several page intake mm -hmm. that everyone comments on and says, this is a lot of paperwork. And I say, I know, but I promise we're going to go through it. And we really do. I want to know you know, what are your main concerns? What are the things that we really want to address? What do you want to work on? Um, 
what do you what do you think the causes of that problem are? Get some insight as far as what the, what the patient thinks is going on because the patient knows their body best. They know their life best, and so they'll mm-hmm. give you hints as far as what started it or what's causing it. We talk about medications, surgeries, family history, sleep and diet and exercise and stress levels and unrelated symptoms that they've got going on because they don't know if it's related or not. Um, We focus a lot on on gut health uh, because that's so important. Um, And then um, kind of, you know, then I kind of ask them what's their commitment level to change because we do ask inevitably there will be some change in their life mm-hmm. you know once we get results there's a new commitment for sure it Lifestyle is changes. <laughs> it is so that appointment usually takes about an hour but you know everyone's a little different some people have less going on some people have more going on so average about an hour mm-hmm. then based on that information i come up with, uh, we want, I want to get some laboratory data. I want to see what their numbers look like. Sometimes that's just, you know, a simple lab that you can take over to commercial lab, like Sonorquest or LabCorp. Sometimes people need food sensitivity testing, you know, like food allergy type testing or heavy metal testing or environmental toxicity testing. So there's some more in-depth things that we can do based on each individual patient. Interesting. Okay. Um, and then a, do you send out for those? Or are you able to do some of those in, in clinic? No, we send them out because some of the tubes require special chemicals to be in the tubes or they need to be frozen sure. or they, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you, and then once the patient has the labs done, it takes about two weeks for the lab to send me all of their data. And we organize it in um, on, a, on a sheet that's easy for both of us to kind of follow. Yeah. So that's when we bring them back for their follow-up visit and we go through, you know, all of the different areas that we've decided to focus on. Um, and as, as we discuss what's going on, I, this appointment also takes about an hour, sometimes more, because I like to go into detail about, you know, what did I test? What does that test mean to you, to the individual? What does the result mean? And if it's out of range, how can we fix it? Um, most patients, what I like to tell people is that my job is to order the data, interpret the data and tell that patient how they can feel better, but what they decide to do is up to them. And there's no pressure from me (laughs) to do anything that I'm talking about. I just want them to know that there is the opportunity to feel better. There's lots of different ways to do it. And whatever feels like it's best for them, then we'll go that direction. Yeah. So I don't sure. push anything on anybody. <laughs> that doesn't benefit uh, me. No, I, I love it because there, there is a growing trend to have patient advocates in some of these larger hospital systems. Right. Like kind of for a similar reason as you're discussing or describing. More and more, the medical field is uh, becoming transparent in, in terms of patients have unlimited access to information and often come to us with with all kinds of ideas or understandings or interpretations about what's going on and what they want to try with. And I, I'm all for, I, I love this age of information that we're in because it, it does prove to me, I've got someone who's committed to their health and committed to getting better. Uh, but also it's like, well, let's join me in this journey with you because we, we're, we're just here to help guide you through and sift through this information to find out ultimately it's about you getting better. It's not about me being right. right. It's about you getting better. Yes. And I just Absolutely. want to join you in this journey. There's yeah. that saying of, of, I've seen it in several doctor's offices, your 15 minute Google search doesn't replace my medical degree. And then I've seen the rebuttal to that of, but your 15 minute lecture doesn't replace my 10 years of living with my condition. It's like, <laughs> absolutely right. Like there's a point of that where it's, as providers, we don't, we don't know it all. And, and as much as yeah. we want to pretend that we, that we do, even with all the access to information that we do, it's like, we're, we're joining you in this journey to better health. And, and we're part of, of that new commitment as well. I, I actually encourage my patients to jump online and research things for themselves. Don't just take it because I've said it, go mm-hmm. and read about it on your own. And I'm confident enough in what I'm, I'm telling the patient that I know, I mean, most patients come back and say, you're right. What I read and, and the 
you know, the research I did led me to the same conclusion and, you know, I'm comfortable moving forward at that point. So I, I, I don't want people to just take my word for it. I want them to go and look, look it up on their own or ask their friends or whatever it may be, uh, because I want them to feel comfortable with the decision they're making, um, you know, as they start their journey to healing. So mm-hmm. I don't want them to feel pressured. <laughs> uh, 100%. It's a very, very different relationship when you feel like we're, we're a team right. versus versus you feeling like uh, I can't trust this guy or gal and I don't understand why they're saying this or, or even worst case, they're afraid to bring up concerns because of, of whatever wrath or feeling of you know, being belittled by well, the provider. It's like, this is not, this is not okay. This is not a, there are, medicine. there are doctors out there, providers out there that will, you know, they will like almost discipline their patient for saying, I'm not sure I want to do this or, what are, what are my other options? Or how do you know that that's what this is? I always, I mean, I can't tell you how many patients I've said, why did you ask your doctor why they decided to put you on that? Or did you ask your doctor how they came to that conclusion? Or I mean, the amount of times I've asked why a thyroid has been taking at been taken out. <laughs> and I said, well, why? And you know, they just said, well, that's what they said to do. And I said, from now on, moving forward, ask questions, know why something is happening to you so that you can be empowered and then you can make decisions for yourself. 100%. It's such a different, such a different model and, and unity of medicine of, of getting there, right. getting to the, the root cause, getting to the ultimate destination, the ultimate outcome of health. Um, right. And it, it's, a lot more thrilling to be a part of that journey than the other way. Right. Now, going back, you did mention something that, that I wanted to bring up and I don't yeah. want to forget, but you said obviously a vitamin D deficiency. And I thought, well, wait a minute, we live in Phoenix. How are we, <laughs> how are we so vitamin D deficient with all the sunshine? Uh, but I hear that often. I hear that very right. often. What, what is it? Is it, is it the ability to process or, or are it, we missing something that, that right. is causing that? You have to have, well, first of all, it's hot here. <laughs> So we stay inside. So most people, yeah, that's the problem is they stay inside until it's cool and then they go outside. And to get enough vitamin D from the sun, you need to be outside for about 30 minutes with most of your body, your skin exposed to absorb enough vitamin D. And I, most people I know are working indoors and are not, not getting that kind of exposure but it's also, you know, we absorb through the skin and we need the gut and the kidneys and, you know, other organs to help process and turn that vitamin D into an active form of vitamin D. But I mean, I can't tell you the number of people that I see with skin dysfunction and gut dysfunction. So even if they are getting that exposure, their body's having trouble, you know, making it into a usable form of vitamin D. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good point. Because uh, I also hear my dermatologist going crazy right now about all of us who suffer from skin cancer or issues yeah. like that. It's like, uh, you know, as long as you're going out there for 30 minutes with sunscreen on, that's, that's the biggest right. thing. Right, right. Yes. <laughs> wear totally. sunscreen. I'm not saying don't wear sunscreen. <laughs> now, when you say um, you know, patients who have come to you, I know you mentioned the fact that many will have uh, stress or trauma, unrealized trauma, uh, mm-hmm. in somewhere in their social or mental history. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there are there anything else like when you look at how do people find you? What is it they're looking for? What is it they're searching that somehow then you you then come up as a solution? Tell me a little bit more about how that journey presents because I know there's a lot of people who are listening that are thinking, well, is, do I need this? Is, this? is this something that I'm looking for? Right. Because they're just, they're just not quite certain of where does this fit into their, so to their health. Most, most of the patients we see are word of mouth. So probably 85% of people we see were referred by a friend, a family member, a coworker. I just had a patient who was sitting at work and heard somebody mentioning something about fatigue and brain fog and sleep. And she like walked away from her computer to go ask what was going on. And then, you know, shortly thereafter had an appointment with me. So a lot of it is word of mouth, which is great because that tells me these people are feeling better. 
they're feeling better and they're sharing it and they want other people to feel better. And so they're, they're, they're giving that information to family and friends and so forth. Um, some of our patients come from, uh, they walk, we, one of my offices is, is next door to Potter's house apothecary. And so many patients will walk in and, and to speak with the pharmacists about what's going on and is there any way to be evaluated or what recommendations for what to take and the pharmacists do send them our way as well. Um, I, as far as if people are listening and wondering whether or not they should be seen, if you're wondering whether or not you should be seen, it, you probably have one of the symptoms that I've mentioned and you should be seen. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. So I have plenty of patients who don't even have you know, a long list of things going on, maybe one thing or two things, but really they want to know how, it, what, what's going on internally. What do their, what does their insulin look like? What, what do their cholesterols look like? Do they have a lot of inflammation? Is their gut okay? Could they optimize their health? So that's another way to look at it as well is for longevity, right? Mm -hmm. To see if there's any deficiencies or imbalances that can be corrected. Um, and so I, I do see a few people like that as well. Okay. That makes more sense. Inevitably, as we, as I go over history with these people, more and more symptoms do pop up <laughs> that mm -hmm. they've been ignoring for 20 years. Um, so, so, but so we can address those, but, um, yeah, we do see people like that as well. Uh, that's a great point because we we talk about things like that all the time of like just how many compromises to your health have you made and, right. and how many compromises to your activity level have you made how many times have you just accepted this new normal when uh you didn't want to but you just figured there's no other solution or everything right. you tried to that point hadn't right. worked and it's like look let's uncover some of those as we go because i think that there's a lot that can be done right now, you've talked about gut health a little bit and some absorption issues, intestinal issues, and I just think it's something that a lot of people aren't aware even existed. What is gut health? What is gut permeability? What are some of these things that people are talking about as, as to why things aren't, why aren't nutrients being absorbed the way that they should be? Or um, how would you describe what, what is a leaky gut or gut permeability? Yeah, people love that term, leaky gut. They think it's yeah. something really disgusting, but it's, it's uh, not. So imagination is not good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the way that I would describe a leaky gut would be there's been damage to the gut in some form or fashion. And that can happen due to the same concept we've been talking about for 20 minutes now, which is stress. Okay. Stress mm -hmm. is number one cause of, of gut tissue breakdown or air injury. Um, but there are other things as well. So infl inflammatory foods, foods that our bodies don't digest well, or don't know what to do with, um, including things that are covered in pesticides and, and other things like that. Um, additionally, medications, not just antibiotics, but antacids and things of mm. that nature. Um, uh, viruses, bacteria parasites, the, there's a long list of what could be going on. <laughs> so, and um, just you know, for reference for our listener, when we say gut, we're talking about the lining of the stomach and small intestines that are primarily responsible for the absorption of that nutrient that, that then is pulled out of that food source and then absorbed into other functions of the, of the body. Right. And so there's that lining that... that the way that we were taught it in school is it's almost like these little like grass in the ocean where the little <laughs> finger like like yeah. things that then then stick out and and they're not supposed to be gapped or spaced or and they're supposed to be quite abundant there's supposed to be a lot of them along the line so i'm the way i'm imagining is that e either there's bigger gaps between some of those uh, absorption qualities those celi the little finger like absorbers of the nutrient bigger gaps in there or fewer of them in number or uh, deficient in their ability to collect the nutrients yes. that then pull it into the body. So because it's not able to do so, it then passes, passes through it along until we excrete it. Right. So you're absolutely right. What, what you can see are uh, gaps where they're not supposed to be tight. They're supposed to be a tight junction, right? That only allows 
very small micronutrients through, but they become damaged and so enlarged. You can have atrophy of those microvilli, which you're talking about those finger-like projections. So they, they okay. actually atrophy or they're damaged. Uh, and so how, how does somebody know that they have leaky gut? The most obvious thing people think of is gut symptoms, right? So loss of appetite, heartburn or GERD symptoms. So like acid reflux, uh -huh. um, the feeling, the sensation of food sitting in the stomach for a long time, um, you know, bowel movement issues, those kinds of things. But actually leaky gut symptoms expand to the entire body because what leaky gut does is it allows for things, molecules, compounds, you know, viruses, bacteria, things that are not supposed to get into the bloodstream to come into the bloodstream. And then they have, you have trouble absorbing the nutrients that you should be absorbing. So you see nutrient deficiencies, which can lead to anxiety, depression, sleep issues, hormonal imbalances. Um, you can see, um, you know, viruses or bacteria or whatever it may be getting into the bloodstream. And so that causes an IgG, so a, a, an immune reaction, which can cause joint pains, which can mm -hmm. cause chronic sinus infections, which can cause autoimmune disease, because sometimes our body doesn't know what to attack. So attacks whatever it wants. <laughs> Some of the food particles and, and bacteria and viruses look similar to what we've got in the body. So now we're attacking joints or we're attacking the thyroid or we're attacking the pancreas. And your leaky gut has now led to um, Hashimoto's thyroid disease or rheumatoid arthritis, which is something I've mentioned, or um, even uh, like a, a diabetic type picture because we've, we've uh, uh, attacked the pancreas. So do you see, do you see these kind of things developing, particularly in our, in our aging population? Uh, whether it's just because they've been on earth more longer, they've had more exposure to these kinds of the medications or poor habits. It, it, uh, and like a lot of things as we age, the sensitivity, uh, vision, ears, skin, strength, everything tends to decline as we right. move on. Uh, does the stomach similarly do that? Are you noticing that? I see it in, in all ages. It, it no is kidding. equal across the board. There are some people that have a very obvious, for example, I had a woman who came to see me because she had to have a partial knee replacement. It became infected twice. So had to have another replacement and all these other sorts of things and therefore was on IV antibiotics and then oral antibiotics for six to eight months. I can't remember the exact duration. And because of that, that stress to the body, the multiple number of surgeries and the long-term use of antibiotics, her gut was so damaged that she was having sudden food issues where she used to be able to eat all these things. And now she was having, you know, gastric pain or whatever, bloating or whatever it was to the food. And then just randomly breaking out in hives body wide. So, mm. and no one could tell her why. <laughs> Interesting. But I said, this is very obviously a leaky gut type of picture. So we figured out exactly which foods her body had created a sensitivity to. We worked on some different things to heal her gut and the hives went away and her gut's better. Fantastic. And then yeah. are they able to reintroduce those foods that were previously sensitive? So it depends on how significant that sensitivity is. Okay. So unlike a regular food allergy test that looks at IgE, which is a different type of immune globulin, we're looking at IgG and IgA. And those are just basically different immune globulins secreted in the blood or secreted in the gut. So it's a different perspective on, on sensitivity or allergy. The more reactive your body is to a specific food, the less likely you'll be able to introduce it later i'm not okay. saying always but if you have a if you have a significant reaction there's a chance that that food should just be avoided so that you don't have pain and and you know rashes or whatever you're having in response to that food but if it's a more moderate reaction we can eliminate those foods for several weeks 
work on healing the gut and then slowly introduce those foods. And I mean, slowly, it has to be done one new food that you were previously sensitive to every three to four days, Hmm. because immune reactions such as IgG take about 72 hours to show up in the body. So if you eat it and you're like, oh, I'm fine. I don't have a headache or my stomach is okay or whatever. You have to wait and see if anything, you know, occurs in the, in the following days. And if not, then you can add that food to your regular diet and then continue forward with whatever else you want to try. Just depends on the person. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Now you may not know the answer to this, but what is it about LA that's caused everyone to have a gluten sensitivity? <laughs> so, uh, my perspective on, on gluten sensitivity, I, I don't know if you've heard this. Have you ever had a patient tell you that they cannot have gluten? They, they know that they have an allergy to gluten, but they go to Europe and they can have pastas and breads and all, all these different yes. gluten and they're just fine. Yes. Why, Why is that? that it, <laughs> it's because it's because of the way we process wheat here in America. Huh. So this is just my. So it's not as refined. Thing. It's not, or is it? Is it too many additives? Is it? It's it's what we spray our crops with. Interesting. And then we don't make sure that we've cleaned the the crop well because everything's quick, 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 quick. We got to get it out. We got to get it ready. We got to get it made. And so our, our bodies become exposed to these toxins. So it's less likely that people have a gluten sensitivity or gluten allergy, and it's more likely that their body can't handle all the pesticides they're consuming. That's why they're having a reaction. They go to Italy or they go to Spain or wherever they're going and they're having all this pasta and they're like, I, I actually lost weight. I feel really good. I, I was able to eat whatever I wanted and they, everything's homemade there. Everything's different. You know, they're not being sprayed with all these chemicals. So. Interesting. Right. Okay. Well, we have a few more minutes and I wanted to make sure we got to long-term COVID symptoms. I know this is another thing that you mentioned Mm -hmm. and I I wanted to save some time for it. What are some of these long-term COVID symptoms that you're saying? I I know brain fog, fatigue, are common ones. Are there others? And then what are you doing about it? So yes, brain fog, fatigue, continued shortness of breath or breathing issues. Um, I have had patients with ongoing chills or the sensation of chills, muscle aching and pain um, and gut dysfunction as well. Um, I, there's a few different things that we can do. Um, Obviously I would recommend doing them a full evaluation of what I had described before to see when you're infected with a virus like COVID, you're, you actually use so many of your cofactors, meaning vitamins and minerals, and also, you know, so many of your hormones to try and fight that inflammation that if you don't replete them, you will just remain deficient. So I, I always recommend, let's see where you're at, what happened to you when you got sick. So address all of those deficiencies or imbalances. And then I like to follow the FLCCC's guidelines on the long haul COVID protocol. Are you familiar? No, they're the, FLCCC. They're the front line. Yes, so they're the they're frontline docs that created the eye mask protocol. Did you, have okay. you heard of that? I've not. Okay, so during COVID, they came up with a protocol that was based in literature um, of uh, ivermectin along with vitamin D, C, zinc, melatonin, and aspirin. Um, and these people were, you know, getting COVID taking this protocol and like 24 hours later feeling significantly better. (laughs) Interesting. So they also, they also came out with a long haul protocol. That's slightly different. Um, and, and it does utilize ivermectin, but a few other things. And there have been a couple of patients that we have started that protocol on and have done a lot better. And it's, it's usually, you know, those deficiencies and imbalances along with, uh, uh, inflammation, some kind of inflammation that their body is just really having trouble getting rid of. So we really try to address that inflammation. And once we do, they, they feel a lot better. Hmm. 
Interesting. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Are, are you seeing, uh, how, like, would you say there's a percentage of COVID positive cases that then lead to people having long term COVID symptoms? Um, is there a number that you're familiar with, or is there a population of people that you commonly see these long term symptoms? It's presented? definitely, it's definitely my older, my older population. Okay. So, you know, 60 plus are, are the ones that have the worst long haul symptoms. It's also the people who have needed to have a, that kind of evaluation of what's going on, why they don't feel good for a long time and they've just ignored it. So they have all these deficiencies and imbalances already. And then they got, they also became very ill. Right, right. Interesting, yeah. okay. Are you noticing that there's very many um, primary care docs or even ER docs that are following the FLCCC? No, no, okay. <laughs> None, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Absolutely not. No, I, I don't know if it's out of fear. I don't know. I don't, I can't answer. I can't tell you why so many people were afraid to follow that protocol. I don't, I don't know why yeah. there's, it's based in evidence. Um, you know, if, if that's your clinical judgment that that patient would benefit from, from something, then you should do it. You should 100% do it. And if the literature is supporting that even more reason. <laughs> right. Right. So do you do that in office? Do you do any of the short-term treatments okay you do okay awesome oh yeah yep yeah i treated covid throughout the past year um or so um and now i'm seeing less active covid and more yeah. of the long haul symptoms yeah do you treat it as an iv or oral how do you how do no you... it's oral it's oral it's yep oral. everything's oral mm -hmm. yeah okay. there are some iv therapies um that are not so much based in literature mm -hmm. that I have tried. <laughs> so I probably shouldn't exactly say what those things are, but there are other options if patients are interested in, in talking about that. But I- That I found to be helpful. Right, they're available. They're just not, I can't say this is based in any kind of data other than what I've seen in in patients so no, totally we're seeing a, a growing trend too with just how much accessibility folks have to iv iv treatments whether that's nutrients um, right. hydration just a simple hydration uh for all, all kinds of reasons that would benefit uh from from that intervention and that's yeah, why i, I was asking if it was iv yeah I, well was... so at the other i have i have another work in another office and um, that we do nad infusions are you familiar with what nad is I'm not. NAD is essentially a, a mm -hmm. cofactor to ATP. So you have to have NAD to be able to make cellular energy, to treat mitochondrial dysfunction and to, to make energy. Does that make sense? Uh huh. The older we get, the more NAD we have to use to have the same amount of energy. And, and then on top of that, if you have chronic illness, you end up using more of your body's NAD. So it's easy to become depleted. I believe that COVID also depletes our bodies of NAD. It makes sense. We have to use a lot of energy to try and fight this virus. So we do, um, we do there are two hour infusions um, and we have treated a few patients with long haul symptoms who feel tremendously better following the infusion. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Always good to have some alternative yeah. solutions to things that are going on that um, we know can be helpful. We can prescribe that from our from our own research and experience, but then uh, to see it actually affect individuals' lives. Uh, I, I do love having these conversations with folks like this because it, it is it's different, it's unique, it's going on, it's helpful. It reminds me of the story about the man walking on the seashore and seeing a bunch of starfish littered all about, and he's picking up one by one, throwing them back in the ocean. And the stranger comes up and says, what are you doing? He says, throwing these starfish back in the ocean. There's thousands of them. They can't possibly make any difference. And he throws one more back in the ocean. And he says, it made a difference to that one. 
It's the same kind of idea. Where, yeah. like, we're out here helping individuals and all that we can do to help them find the, the best path to health is absolutely why, why we're on this crusade. Right. Ali, thank you for your time. Much appreciated. I very much uh, learned a great deal about what is gut health, how functional medicine can be impactful, what treatment options do exist for long-term and long-haul COVID symptoms, even some short-term ones. And, uh, and then easily how to contact you. Ali, real quick, what, what is the best way? Do you have a website? Do you have a way that people can contact you that would uh, make it very easy to get to connect? Yes, um, we do have a website. Um, the functional medicine office is uh, bellasanowellness.com, B-E-L-L-A-S-A-N-O wellness.com. You can make appointments online. There's also contact points on there if you want to ask questions our phone number is there if you want to call and ask questions i'm always happy to answer questions before scheduling any appointments with with individuals so Great. that's probably the best way to get a hold of me and you're located on that office on 77th avenue and deer valley in Peoria, right correct yep right next to potter's house of yes we'll, yep. we'll include that in the notes you know, for okay. our episode thank you thank you again ali a pleasure thank fantastic Preferred Physical Therapy and the guests on this show does not recommend, endorse, or make any representation about the efficacy, appropriateness, or suitability of any specific tests, products, procedures, treatments, services, opinions, healthcare providers, or other information that may be contained on or available through this content. Preferred Physical Therapy and the guests on this show are not responsible nor liable for any advice, course of treatment, diagnosis, or any other information, services, or products that you obtain through this audio recording. For specific information regarding your case, please consult a licensed professional in your area.